All right, so uh, let's see what we have here. Bonds in the United States, you don't need to know, there's not much to learn. It's called automated bond system, are traded on automated bond system. It's a computerized system, there's no point to discuss what it is. Uh, for more than 100 years, the biggest traders will be called bond dealers. Bond dealers will be financial institutions specializing in trading bonds. They will be buying when you want them to buy and they will be selling when they want to sell. So they will be acting as dealers. They will maintain inventory. As dealers, they will do both buy and they will do both sell. And they will provide a buy quote and they'll provide a sell quote. Another important characteristic of uh, Another important characteristic is liquidity. Many or most bonds, corporate bonds, are not very liquid. We say they are illiquid and they're a little harder to sell. They're not so easy to sell. Now, corporate bonds uh, are a little more difficult to evaluate. Uh, meaning evaluate the credit risk. Credit risk is the same as default risk. Is the risk that the bond will not be able to be paid in full and on time that maybe they, they cannot pay, that they may be what we may call partial default. On the due date, they have to pay 10 million, they have 7 million in cash, they'll pay 7, and on the other 3, they will have a partial default, okay? So, you have credit risk. Credit risk is very tricky to evaluate because they may be, well, I just deleted them, call provisions, they may be warrants, they may be secured, unsecured, maybe senior bonds, junior bonds, subordinated. It makes it very difficult to evaluate bonds. So, uh, major investors in bonds, fi financial institutions, will have people, a whole department, which will evaluate, recall this credit worthiness. <coughs> credit worthiness is the ability of a borrower to pay back loans is credit worthiness, to pay back credits. In other words, you determine how worthy the borrower is of credit. Because it's tricky, because it's complicated, because a lot of ordinary people or small investors can't do that properly, you have specialized institutions for that. We had this quite a few times ago. Uh, they are called credit ratings agencies. These are like financial institutions, but they're just agencies that specialize 
in providing credit ratings of borrowers. Credit rating is an evaluation of the credit worthiness of a borrower and two things the ability to pay back the loan and the risk of default which is the same the ability to pay back is the opposite of default so how likely it is that they will pay back and how likely it is that they will default so Credit ratings are provided by credit rating agencies. Last time, well, quite a few lectures ago, we discussed that unfortunately, in the United States, you have only three licensed or authorized. Let's try and get their names. Uh, uh, Moody's, S&P, and the third one is Fitch, because they are licensed by the government and they are protected by the government. They got a secure business. They don't have to worry about giving good. They don't talk about appropriate. The credit ratings could be bad, very bad. It doesn't matter. You know, their job is secure by the government's license and the government that's part of the system being corrupt is that the government does not allow you, me, or anybody else to get the license to become a credit rating agency. That's at the core of corruption. If there is competition, the competition will keep these companies honest and uncorrupt. Because if there's number four and number five, people will learn and understand that the S&P is corrupt and they'll use number four. And if number four is corrupt, then number five will come. So as long as there is competition, competition keeps the market honest. When there is no competition, there is incentive for each and every one of them to be corrupt, and they all are. And the problem is that there is no punishment for giving a wrong credit rating. There is, we call it, no liability. So nothing really happens. They can give a bad credit rating. Nothing really happens. Okay, let's see what else we have. And sometimes the credit rating, we say, measures the credit worthiness. Sometimes we say it measures the credit quality. Now, uh, here is something that a lot of people are confused and it's very easy to make a mistake. The credit rating relates to a particular debt. It relates to a particular credit or it relates to a particular bond issue. And if you're a corporation, if you have four different bond issues, maybe one uh, uh, maturing in 2016, another one in 2020, another one in 2030, and another one in 2040. Each particular bond issue will have its own credit rating. And it is wrong to think or to assume that if it's the same issuer, the credit rating on each bond will be the same. No, definitely not. If the, the debt or the issue is small, the credit rating will be higher because it's easier to pay. If it's very large, the credit rating will be lower because it's harder to pay. Again, if it is secured, the credit rating will be higher. If it's unsecured, the credit rating will be lower. If it's subordinated, it's going to be even lower. So credit uh, rating refers to debt and does not refer to the borrower. It does not relate to the borrower. So one and the same borrower can have three or five different 
credit ratings on three or five different bond issues. That's important to understand. Uh, usually, credit rating agencies will give on a particular debt the same credit rate. But sometimes, one agency will give a higher rating and one agency will give a lower rating. This is for you, page 175 at the very bottom, note number 7. This is called split rating. Split rating is when one rating agency gives one credit rating and a different credit agency gives a different credit rating which happens to be higher or lower than the other credit rating agency. Now, there is a little table over here that you don't need to learn but I will go over them. Uh, credit could be best quality, as in highest quality. This is associated with low risk. I am now on page 176. It could be of high quality. High quality means highly likely to get repaid. Very low with risk. It could be upper medium grade. It could be medium grade. Then a little lower becomes speculative. So in bonds, in bonds, the word speculative for bonds, speculative bond, simply means risky. means risky. And then of course it could be, as the table shows you, very speculative. It could be what's called in poor standing, means they are already in trouble, they can't pay, or they already default. Now, the concept that you need to learn and understand is extremely simple, extremely basic, that all credit ratings are divided into two major categories. The first category, that's on page 177, is called investment grade bonds. <clears throat> the word Grade in English means quality, as in credit quality. Investment grade, well, let's do this. I'll put here up front. Bonds will be investment grade. The simplest, easiest way to understand is that they are low risk. And the alternative to investment grade is known as junk, as in junk bonds. Junk means high risk. So the main classification that you need to learn, understand, and maybe show on the exam is what's the difference between investment grade and junk. The difference is risk. Investment grade is low risk and junk bonds are high risk. Okay. These are usually allowed to be in mutual funds, pension funds, insurance companies and most financial institutions are restricted into investing in junk bonds. So, Usually, anyone can invest here. Here, you got to understand that it's a junk bond. Let's see what else we got. These junk bonds, because after a while, 
was understood that most of them are junk. Right? Pick yourself a table anywhere. Anywhere. These, because they were called, uh, they were understood that they were junk. You couldn't call them junk. You want me to sell you some junk? You know, that's not a good idea. So, they renamed them to high yield. And high yield sounds good. It sounds really attractive. High yield is meant to confuse investors, okay? It's meant to mislead them. And again, in Wall Street, a lot of things are given names that are meant, the goal, the purpose is to confuse people. People not to understand what it is. So you think, oh, I'm getting high yield bond. You want a, a, a bond that yields 5% when the interest rate is 1%? You say, yeah, I want high yield. But you don't understand that you're sold junk bonds, okay? That's the whole thing. So remember, I started early on with the word on Wall Street, security. Where security became a substitute for paper, as in paper assets, as in financial assets. People understood that paper is risky. Paper has always been risky. Financial assets or financial instruments are always risky because a financial asset is someone else's liability and a promise by someone else to pay. And usually, back in the old days, people didn't keep their promises. They promise, but they don't pay later on. That's normal, that's usual. So people understood that they are very insecure paper assets, that they are highly risky. So over time, they call, oh, you want some security? And everybody wants security. They didn't understand that they were sold, well, didn't realize they were sold paper assets. And over the decades, they changed the name, okay? Now, uh, later on, uh, let's say 30 years, 40 years ago, they were developing countries like Thailand and Malaysia and Indonesia. And these were very high risky countries. They were considered junk. But you tried to sell to investors junk, it was very hard. So they came up with this name called Emerging market. Emerging market. Now, people before were lending to developing countries, and developing countries usually will go in default, meaning developing country will issue bonds, and the country, like Argentina or Brazil or Mexico, will typically default. So developing debt and developing bonds, people understood were bad. People understood were junk. So what Wall Street did is come up with a new name, emerging market. It's like you're down under the ground, under the water, and you're slowly emerging into development. So emerging sounds good and nice, but again, it's still a name for country which is underdeveloped and highly likely to default down the road. All right, let's see what else we got here. John Bonds, okay. Uh, next little piece is, you may take, let's say, 100 investment grade bonds and their price will be going up and down. You're gonna have a bond index bond index. So an index is simply a number that summarizes many different things. So an inflation index will be a number that summarizes the price increases in 100 different, let's say, consumer goods. 
a stock market index will be, let's say, for 30 stocks. Dow Jones Industrial Average will have 30 stocks. The index will be average of 30. Well, a bond index, you may have a investment grade bond index telling you what is the pricing or the yield of investment grade bonds and then you have a junk bond index telling you what's going to be the price or the yield on junk bonds next one will be next section uh, it's kind of like 177 uh, should try there's not too much left is bond market participants who are the participants Well, first big one will be commercial banks. Doesn't mean the biggest, but one of the bigger players. Probably the biggest will be mutual funds. Again, we started in lecture whatever early on from chapter one what is a mutual fund they invest usually in stocks and bonds and they maintain relatively low risk so mutual funds will be investing mostly almost entirely in investment grade bonds uh, hedge funds they'll be investing in both investment grade bonds and in junk bonds. They invest in bonds which they think will be, uh, you know, give a return. There's a possibility that a hedge fund will short bonds. Short meaning they will sell the bond expecting the price to go down. Okay. They'll sell usually, sorry, short investment grade bonds expecting them to become junk. Okay. Uh, of course, one of the biggest investors will be insurance companies. Will be major investors. Uh, major, probably the biggest participants are those that specialize in bonds. I already wrote it up there, bond dealers. And they'll be constantly buying and selling. Of course, you will have some, but not too many, individuals. We call these households. Let's see what else we got. Okay, well that's good enough. Now, every bond, I'm switching to something else now, every bond has a, like every security, every, every investment has a return. Of course, every investment has a risk. This is the foundation of finance. All finance is based on, number one, time value of money, and number two, risk and return, okay? The return on a bond is called a yield. We did that many chapters ago, right? And the yield that you will get if you keep the bond until Maturity is called yield to maturity. Yield to maturity. Okay. And every bond will have its yield to maturity. So, Government bonds will give you, government bonds are considered to be default-free, they're called risk-free, will give you the 
risk-free yield. Risk-free. Yields. Okay. And the next one becomes you're going to have investment grades. Investment grades. We're going to have their own investment grade yield. The risk-free yield, because it's a lower risk, will have a lower yield, and the investment grade will have a higher yield. Now, the difference, the difference between the investment grade yield and the risk-free yield is called the, and that's an important one, credit. Spread. In finance, the word spread means difference. And there are hundreds of different, you guys having fun? There are different types of spreads, have a big ask spread or buy and sell spread. So here, credit spread is the spread, the yield or the interest that corporations must pay over and above the government to borrow. Okay. And then you have, let's call it with this name, junk yield, we call it the high High yield doesn't mean high yield, okay? High yield means yield on junk bonds. Okay? So, the difference between investment grade yield and high yield is called the junk spread. The junk spread. These are the two most important spreads. I mean, there are many, many, many more, but these are the two ones that you need to learn and understand. Uh, there is one more section. Let's see what we got. Okay. International bond markets. Bond markets have become, we call it, globalized and become internationalized. And I did maybe, I think last time I did, did I do syndicate last time? Syndicate in investment banking? Yes. Yes. So, when you issue bonds internationally, you will have an international syndicate. is a group of financial institutions working together for a common goal. Syndicates are usually formed to issue bonds. They're usually formed by investment banks to sell bonds. So an international syndicate simply means that a major corporation, could be like McDonald's or General Electric, General Motors, and all of major well-known could be even Apple, but not particular. Apple is not a big borrower. Well, it's been recently become a big borrower, borrowing billions of dollars. We'll have an international syndicate. Means that there's going to be investment banks in Japan, and investment banks in Germany, in France, in London, in Hong Kong, in Singapore. And it's simply a syndicate connect, uh, 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 of uh, 
investment banks from different countries, okay? You will try to issue the same security and sell it in many different countries around the world. Uh, the main reason is believed to be, it's called international diversification. Diversification is the reduction of risk by investing in many different securities, in different assets. And, internet, and diversification is believed to be highly beneficial to the investor by lowering the risk. And international diversification is considered equally to be beneficial. Instead of investing everything, let's say, in the United States, you spread it between the United States and Europe. Or better, instead of investing everything in the US and Europe, invest everything in the US, Europe, and Asia. Some will be in developed countries like Japan, uh, United States, and England, maybe Switzerland, okay? And some will be in developing countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Cambodia. So, international diversification is a major reason for the development of global financial markets and global bond markets. Uh, now, you may have a bond issued in the United States in other countries and still denominated in US dollars. Most bonds around the world may be issued in a foreign country and still issued in dollars. For example, it's very common to issue in dollars bonds in Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, they will not be issued in Hong Kong dollars. They'll be still issued in US dollars. Same thing applies to, I think it's coming later on, Euro bonds. will be US dollars, sorry, bonds issued usually in Britain or somewhere else in Europe, outside the United States, and still denominated in US dollars. So Euro bond, Euro doesn't mean denominated in Euro, means it is denominated in US dollars in a, and sold in a country outside the United States. Let's see what else what I have. Okay, yeah, you, that's the next section, 182. So, the word Euro means that the bond is issued in a country outside and it's going to be in a foreign currency. So, you may issue, let's say, in Japan, but it's going to be still in U.S. Okay, let's see what else we've got here. Well, it's very confusing, uh, but again, uh, there is no need to exactly memorize. You've got the concept of a foreign bond. And let me read foreign bond. That's on page 183. Again, long-term bonds. All bonds are long term, okay? Issued by corporations or governments, again, outside of the foreign issuer's country. So, Americans issuing in Germany, or Singaporeans issuing in Japan, or Japanese issuing in London. So, it is outside the issuer's country and in the currency in the country in which they're issued. So, Japanese issuing bonds in London in British pounds, that's a foreign bond. Or Americans issuing bonds in London in British pounds. 
Now, let's try to clarify the difference. Americans issues in, issuing in London bonds in dollars will be euro bonds, but in pounds will be foreign bonds. Okay. And finally, there is one other uh, last one out there on page 185 is sovereign, sovereign bonds. Sovereign bond is usually a bond issued by a foreign government, usually in foreign currency, usually dollars, outside the whole country. So, Saudi Arabia issuing US dollar bonds in London. That's a very common case. Cambodia issuing in US dollars. Again, the dollar is not the native currency of Cambodia. Dollar is the US currency issuing, whether in Europe, whether in London, whether in New York. That would be considered a sovereign bond. And there is some other stuff for which we don't have time, like Brady bonds. It's not so important. That completes entirely chapter, uh, what is it, six on bonds, and of course will be included in the midterm. Right? Okay.